All right, let's uh, start. Um, so welcome to our panel on building back U.S. business with resilience and imagination. Um, I'm Martin Reeves. I'll be uh, facilitating the panel today. Uh, let me introduce our, our three guests with very diverse backgrounds uh, who help us to address this question. So we have Judy Samuelson, who is the founder and director of the Business and Society Program at the Aspen Institute and uh, author of a, of a new book that's relevant to today's discussion called Six New Rules of Business. We'll be touching on that later. Uh, we've got Mark Mabry, the, the CTO of uh, Stanley Black & Decker, the world-leading uh, tools company, um, who's had a distinguished career in both the public and private sectors around uh, innovation and technology. And we have Sana Al-Badri, who is founder of the Sage Fund, which has been described as Europe's first sustainable bank for, uh, for, for millennials. Um, so just by way of introduction to the theme, um, COVID was, uh, I think, a great test of resilience for all of our societal systems, company supply chains, the finance system, the economy, the public health system, civil society more generally. And, and of course, now we add Ukraine to the equation. Um, so resilience is, on, is definitely a word that's on everyone's lips. Um, but that doesn't mean that we know how to systematically uh, engender it, um, and it doesn't mean that we won't forget about resilience when we uh, when we will remember resilience when we go into recovery. Um, I think some parts of society were more resilient than others. Um, new winners emerged amongst resilient companies. We developed a vaccine in a tenth of the time it normally takes. On the other hand, the voice of science was extraordinarily ineffective in creating uh, rapid and uh, comprehensive compliance with. Uh, with public health uh, mandates um, and uh, policy and its implementation were widely var varied in their effectiveness across different uh, towns and, and states. So we're, today we're going to see if we can extract any hints on uh, any of that so that we can uh, not only be temporarily resilient, uh, but actually build back systematically with resilience and, uh, and imagination. So um, my opening question is, um, what are some of the main opportunities to to build back better coming out of COVID. So Judy, from a business and society dimension, what are some of those opportunities? So thanks, Martin, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, yeah, we, a, lot, a lot of questions around resilience. You teed, them, you teed up some of the most important ones right there. I think we all would have a different angle in maybe on what that means today, but it's hard, frankly, to have this conversation without thinking about what's going on in Ukraine. That's clearly a, uh, a current, um, you know, it's going to be with us a long time, and it's definitely dominating the news cycles for all the reasons that we know are critically important. And business has played a role here. I mean, it's uh, our attention is drawn to looking at this crisis. For those of us that follow business closely, we're, we're captivated by some of the challenges that have been placed on business's shoulder to try to figure out how do they recalibrate the relationship with Russia and beyond. And um, so I would step back and just say a couple things. One, we enter this work, the Business and Society Program, which is part of the Aspen Institute. We start with the simple belief that business is, is perhaps the most powerful and influential institution of our day. In a moment like this, and frankly, during COVID as well, government became, you know, much more a part of the conversation. But we will not, business represents remarkable capacity, talent, problem-solving skills, and we can't address our most complex problems without business at the table. So we kind of start with that, but then we ask the questions about what is business really designed to do, and are we getting the best we can out of business? And that can take us down the rabbit hole of governance and some of the critically important questions about making sure that business uh, actions are really aligned with the kind of intentions and some of the lofty proclamations that we get from business. But I just say in this moment, the last thing I say just for starters is that I think even in this world where we're we're fearful of of a kind of global ramifications and the impacts of what's going on currently, whether it be the pandemic or you know politics or the political environment, that we have to kind of come back and say, What's business's role here and what does it need to do at home in a way? And by home, I don't necessarily mean in the U.S. versus somewhere else, but 
what what are the things that business simply has to attend to that it has great power and influence to affect but we're bound back to the health of the business system itself and i think ultimately connect back to the health of of our democracy and that takes us into a treatment of employees it takes us into the impact of business decisions on communities certainly the environmental questions that, that remain with us and will be with us for a long period of time thank you judy um, so same question to, to you, Mark. Um, of course, there will be a next crisis. Uh, there'll, there'll be a, a recession or a, a pandemic or whatever it is. We can't tell what it will be. But um, what, what are the opportunities such that when we face the next uh, social crisis, we'll say, well, we really learned something we built back better? Well, it's a great question, Martin. And, and uh, uh, hello to everyone out there and, and echoing Judy's point. Uh, about uh, sort of maybe in slightly different terms, I'll put it is it's really a systems of systems problem. Um, it is a need for government, industry, academia, and nonprofits, civil society uh, to address resilience. So it's, it's a collective challenge we have. But uh, maybe as the voice here of industry, um, we have not only a, a special opportunity, particularly global multinationals like our, our own company, uh, but also an, a unique responsibility. And, and I would argue that, you know, we live in this VUCA world that we're all, you know, this highly volatile and uncertain complex world. Uh, and, and so how do we build, um, uh, you know, a stronger future that's more resilient? And, and to me, uh, that goes to the key elements uh, that are challenges for us. You know, the, the, the equity challenges we have, the divides, the digital divides, the economic divides, the social divides, the political divides, the military divides. So how do we find build bridges or, or common understanding? In, in industry, that means things like, you know, we are interdependent, whether or not we're looking for carbon neutrality in our plants or we're looking for resilience in our supply chains or we're looking for safety in our products. These are all interdependent uh, kind of activities or innovation. So it's resilience in our people, very important. Uh, so investing in education and training and lifelong learning, very critical. Diversity in our supply chain, uh, in our innovations, in our, even our innovation investments. Um, also the, the, the move towards, I think, um, uh, smarter models of resilience, you know, uh, observing how nature has, uh, has taught us that, that there are exophiles, things that actually thrive in these intense environments, whether they be in, in nature, chemical, you know, thermal, uh, you know, or other biological challenges, and yet they're able to overcome, right? You know, and, and even we're fighting nature right now with the, with the pandemic and, you know, with the new, new emergent, uh, you know, new, new evolution. So I think, I think we as, uh, you know, multinationals, but also as societies have a collective responsibility to understand uh, resilience and uh, anti-fragility, what I think is post-resilience, and actually to, to, to work together to, to make a, 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 a brighter future, frankly. Thank you, Mark. So same question to, to you, Sana. You, um, you have this very different uh, vision for the future of finance. Um, um, do you think we're on track to get it? And what is that vision? And how do we build back better in, uh, in, in finance? Yeah, I mean, something that's that's been really interesting to see during COVID and I actually even see it in a hopeful way is that when the when the news hit that COVID was going to become a global p pandemic, of course, the markets crashed. But then companies that had better ESG scores, um, they they didn't crash as much and they actually recovered like faster um, when the market was um, going up again. So and that's pretty much also in line with uh, research of the past the decades that companies that take ESG seriously actually show our performance and they are also less volatile. So I, I think that basically we have this like false dichotomy that investing into impact or being more sustainable is, well, there is a green premium, but that it's basically something um, that like interferes with business objectives when actually it's the opposite. I think basically business is about solving problems. Like people have pains and issues and businesses make money by providing solutions to people. So the climate crisis is a big problem. So Business that manage to solve it will just profit a lot from from it, and I think this is also why Larry Fink says that um, the next uh, thousand unicorns, so these are startups with um, valued over one billion, will be in climate tech. So I think what 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 we can do is to um, be excited about 
it being a business opportunity, essentially. And we should just um, think about it like AI or blockchain or Web3. It's like something exciting you can invest in and uh, something where ambitious people go, you know, to uh, build a career and uh, make outsized returns and uh, provide a benefit to society. Thank you, Sam. So let's let's dig into yeah. some of that. Um, so, so, Mark, um, I know the Stanley Black & Decker um, actually had a formal resilience program before COVID began. Um, you were actually thinking about resilience in in stable times before the crisis. Um, t- tell us about how, how you thought about institutionalizing resilience and why you did that ahead of uh, the crisis. You know, um, our, our CEO, Jim Lurie, likes to talk about going into a crisis strong, uh, you know, not only surviving, but thriving and coming out stronger. And uh, to your point, Martin, uh, anticipating that, you, as you, you noted at the beginning, there's we're, we're, there's yet another crisis on the horizon. We don't maybe know know what it is. Uh, you know, I think nobody expected uh, us to be in the in the you know situation in Eastern Europe that we are in right now. But you know, something's gonna something's gonna happen. And so, um, you know, the, like they say, you know, with, you know, the best uh, time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The best uh, the second best time is to do it now. Uh, to, you know, so, you know, riffing on what Sana, uh, you know, has said, you know, we did a bunch of things in our company being very clear about protecting our people, about protecting our customers and, and their, uh, you know, their, their uh, value chains, uh, and then being committed to our, our, our environment. Uh, and, and I mean that in the broadest sense, of course, starting with the people in the communities they live in, because guess what? The disease propagated, just as one example, just like uh, our, we, we now know our carbon footprint is not just scope one and scope two, but it's scope three. Ninety-seven percent of our of our of our uh, of our uh, in, in CO two footprint is scope three. Uh, so if we solve our three percent, we've not done sufficient resilience for for Mother Nature. Um, so we have to do it, with, and we're already starting, as as you noted, uh, with our suppliers in that particular area, and and so. Uh, I think we collectively have a uh, have responsibility to build that resilience in multidimensionally. Um, and one final point, I love what San has said about, um, uh, about and I'll, I'll just put it in my, my, the words I use. Um, I, I've been using a phrase for the past couple of weeks called green is green. And uh, basically the idea is that, that uh, you know, expensive or environmentally friendly is a false choice. Uh, it's not that you can have one or the other. We have to have, and we can have both. It's limited, as you've written yourself, uh, Martin, by our imagination. Um, and there are many, many examples of people turning waste from a cost center into a profit center, minimizing waste, uh, converting you know uh, uh, what it, what is a you know, new product features into market differentiators and growth drivers. So I, I think exactly with what, what Sana said, green is green. It is. A economic imperative for businesses to realize um, you can be profitable and can grow and be environmentally responsible uh, together. So, so a couple of interesting things to dig further into there a little bit. Um, so you talked about working with your suppliers. And, and of course, one of the interesting things about resilience is it's not a property of, of individual agents like companies. It's a property of total systems. So if, if you think you're resilient and your supply chain isn't, you're not resilient. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do, you, how do you think about that um, wider system resilience? What, what, what have you thought about doing in, in that dimension? And how does business get better at that, which, of course, is extraordinarily relevant in the context of this collective action problem we have, climate change? Well, first, businesses have to realize that their risk with their suppliers, if we just want to focus on them, is multidimensional. Uh, there are cyber risks. Uh, there are environmental risks. Uh, there are resilience in terms of, you know, will the supply be there um, when I need it? Um, and so it's our responsibility as the, uh, you know, manufacturer in this case. Um, and we, by the way, are a supplier, right? So we have right now a, a joint effort uh, with Porsche and, and Circularity with the blockchain to measure our, for a couple of our products that we produce, that we pro- provide automotive manufacturers, not because any government has said we want to do it, but we want a verifiable, uh, indelible record of what our environmental uh, you know, if you will, a uh, footprint is so, so we can prove it to, to ourselves and to others in the future. Similarly, we want to put pressure, you know, sometimes it might be a requirement on a, a provider in terms of what they need to report. Uh, it might be environmental, it might be cyber risks. Um, it might actually be, we want you to be green. So we have a partnership in Europe now uh, with Eastman where we have put on the market last month, months ago, actually now um, our first 
uh, tools that are actually made out of out of water bottles, plastic water bottles, and and fifty percent of of the resin comes from plastic water bottles. Now, eventually, we want to not only reuse, we also want to recycle, and so it, it, it's it's back to your book, uh, uh, which I love so much. It's reimagining the future. Just because we've always made it made things with metal or plastic doesn't mean we can't make them differently. In the yeah, future. just just to follow up on imagination. So I think. You've spoken to your investors about the fact that the world we've returned to or, or are returning to is not the same as the one before. It's a different mm. profile of demand. Um, so how did you track that change reality? Uh, and, and how did you think about reimagining for the post-COVID period? Mark. Oh, Mark, that, that, <laughs> so I think all of us can answer that. Um, great, great question. Um, one of the things we did is because of force, we could not have people together. So we had to keep them apart. Um, so we not only changed, uh, you know, introduced a whole bunch of new technology. And I'll, I'll you know, credit Rhonda Gass, our, our CIO for this. Uh, we brought in really a diversity of Cisco, WebEx, Zoom, MS Teams, etc. But we also changed our operations to virtual. And actually, we worked in that case, you know, uh, you know, uh, citing back something that that uh, that Judy said earlier on. We worked with the government. We actually had government L Lamont in Connecticut change the law of Connecticut so we could hold a shareholders meeting virtually. It was illegal to do it. You had to do it in person. And yet it would have been immoral to do it because we would have been a super spreader event. So we worked with the governor and he was very, very effective, uh, very entrepreneurial and, uh, and and changed the law to allow us to do that virtually. Um, we now do uh, team meetings. We do we product reviews. We do business reviews. We do investor relations. We do uh, inspections of plants, uh, sometimes with the government, all virtually. And then finally, sales. You know, we've become an omni-channel. I mean, if you take a look at, uh, you know, not only that people were going to Home Depot and they're going to Lowe's, very important uh, to get, get their products uh, and interactions. But increasingly, some would have to go uh, online. So Amazon, Alibaba, El Mercado, globally. E-commerce uh, became a, a mm, very yeah. critical source of provisioning in a safe manner. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So, so let's move on to, to you, Sana, and dig into a couple of things. Um, so you have this vision of sustainable finance. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you two questions. Um, you know, what is that vision? And, and also, um, you know, I think some, for some things, COVID has probably distracted us from where we were going. In, in others, yeah, it has sure. accelerated. So... Do you think yeah. that we're more on track towards your vision uh, now or or less than we, we need to be? I would say more on track because initially, because I started my, building my business a couple, like a few months before COVID. And then when COVID hit, I was like, okay, I'm done. Like nobody wants to invest and everybody will be very pessimistic. We'll be very focused on Corona. Nobody cares about climate change. But sort of the opposite happened. Like the demand for sustainable investments has like gone up immensely i would say i think like um fund inflows has doubled so that was actually well sorry my mic my headphones fell so that was actually really really great and uh, a lot of people were sort of more activated in their conscious in their conscience so in that sense i think actually it was an acceleration and then i saw all these vc funds um raise big big funds um like hundreds of millions um to invest in climate tech so so like suddenly the ecosystem was actually much more active than it was before because i think in 2011 um or like 2010 there was like a climate tech or green tech wave where people were investing in solar panels and wind energy and hydro energy but it's kind of seen as failed because at the time you couldn't really scale the technologies and then people were really disappointed so then like we didn't touch it for a long time so i think now there's sort of like almost a renewal i would say especially from VCs that investing in climate has, has upsides. And I think all of my business angels, they want to come and invest with us because- So, what, so what are the key elements of your vision for building back better? <laughs> yeah. what, 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 what is the, how would you characterize like the traditional asset management or banking world and what does it need, what does it need to be? What, 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 is yeah. that, what is that vision? I mean, to, Traditional asset management and banking is focusing on financials. So they look at um, debt and sales and all these financial metrics, EBITDA and so on. And then they make judgments based on that. But a sustainable financial system would incorporate many more dimensions. So you would look at the impact a company has on, on the environment, also on its staff, 
on like how how do their customers feel like do they have good privacy laws so it's actually very holistic so you actually look at business with with not just one dimension but you really look at it from all the dimensions and i mean e esg is a good start but it also doesn't exactly put enough pressure so for example apple has really good esg scores and also fair enough like if you compare them to other big tech companies they have really great supply chains and you can recycle the iPhone. They don't use precious metals anymore, almost no precious metals. So they've innovated so much. But in the end effect, they're not circular at all. They have still a huge impact on the environment. So getting good ESG scores is not enough. So I think that moving forward, you really need to focus on themes. So your investments have very clear themes like my this investment is about reducing plastic. This This investment is about creating... Um, cleaner, more abundant water so that you really drill into the themes instead of, oh, um, if I build this factory here, I stress the water. And when the water is stressed, then I can't continue making my chemicals. Therefore, my ESG ratings are bad. Like that's not enough, you know? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, so you, you have a very optimistic message then. You're saying yeah. that, that there is a better vision of finance and we're actually yeah. more on track to getting it than we, than we were. Um, yeah, that's what the numbers show. How do we accelerate it further? You know, if you're um, if you're a major investor, or if you're um, if you're in government, or if you're a, a major incumbent bank, say, what? Well, how can we go even faster? What are some of the key, the key, the key measures? Yeah, it's. I I'm not totally sure, but something that I find very interesting is like the tokenization of uh, financial assets. So that means it's much like it's much easier to just invest in assets. Like you create a virtual version of the asset and then you can trade it much, much more easily and you can buy it. Um, you can, you, you don't have to buy entire shares. You can just buy a small part of them. So I think to be honest, decentralization and blockchain is really important there. And um, also creating like, markets that maybe aren't so so tied to the regulators because they're very slow to be honest so i think that we need to focus on also alternative types of assets and creating more digital kinds of assets to enable things and i think also very very radical things i think um you and me actually martin we were on this panel with uh, catherine um she was uh, she's the ceo of a uh, sovereign uh, nature initiative and she has some like very disruptive Yes. Oh. Um, yeah. So we, we uh, yeah, we lost you for a second there, but you're back. Um, no Judy, worries. M- moving on to you. Um, so all of the, the big social and ecological themes you were thinking about going into COVID, um, was all of that accelerated by COVID? Are we in a better place now or are we, are we distracted, do you think? I don't think we're in a better place now. I don't think it's a win-win world. I don't think green is green all the time. I think green is more green than the social stuff is green. Um, I feel like I'm the skunk at the garden party here, but no, I don't think we're further ahead. I think we're embedded in, I think, shareholder primacy. I think the narrative has changed in, and that is, you know, this is about mindsets. This is about business leadership at some level. Setting intentions has to happen first, but we've got a long way for reality particularly for public companies to catch up with this vision that um, and the exciting things that are happening on that are happening are happening. Right. And some of these things do pay, but a lot of it doesn't pay. And uh, if you move into the kind of S part of ESG, it gets a lot more complicated. And even the environmental piece, even the investment that's required Tremendous investment is required. And what are we actually investing in? Public companies are buying back shares, taking 90% of profits every year and returning them to the shareholders in dividends and share buybacks, going to the bank and borrowing in order to buy back shares and leaving very little in the treasury to invest in the workforce, to raise wages as appropriate in this moment coming out of COVID and beyond in terms of recalibrating the value of the people that actually create the value, what piece of it they're walking away with. You know, the other part of resilience is you can't have a resilient company in a democracy.
democracy that is at risk. And I think we all know that, but what are the elements of it that tie back? I think the fact in the United States, this is a U.S. meeting. I think the fact that it's, so it's fair to talk about the U.S. context in particular right today. It's not the only thing going on, but let's come back to that for a minute if we might. And I think our democracy is at risk. And I think it's at risk in part because a lot of people don't have a stake in the system today. And a lot of yeah, people are true. in the bush. And business is our wealth creation yeah. vehicle. It is the most important vehicle for creating real wealth. But it has to be doing it in a way that is more equitable than the current rules of the game provide. Well, and I, you know, I Judy, I'm, say- I'm wondering, don't you think that businesses that basically basically do what you just described, like buying back their shares and then taking all the debt and not investing in their workforce, um, are they just not going to fail eventually? Like just it's like in a matter of years, they will just be simply outperformed. Well, the system is failing. That doesn't mean those individual companies fail. But the system is failing, and um, that's our that's our reality. And so we need business leaders to be able to stand up and kind of do things that may not make sense in terms of their own particular company. And as we know, you know, if Walmart raises wages, the stock price is depressed, and it may not rebound very quickly. And so mm-hmm. those that's the that is the real quid pro quo when you're talking about a public company. And I know we're not just talking about public companies, but I think even in private companies, there are both public companies that have more protection because of the structure of the ownership. And we have private companies that are very bad examples. You know, let's take Purdue Pharmaceuticals and what happened there. Um, you know, maybe it's about scale as opposed to public versus private at some level. But I think it is a more complex. And in ESG, it's all about the G. Right. That's so- we have so let's, right. let's again, that's a great provocation, Judy, a lot in there to unpack. Um, so, so let me ask about, the, about climate first. Um, you know, on the face of it, we're doing a lot, right? Every company has a purpose. Um, a lot of companies now yeah. have ESG metrics. Um, we, a lot of them have uh, made uh, carbon, uh, the carbon neutrality uh, pre- pledges and so on. Yet the, the trajectory of the CO2 emissions and temperature rises is hardly deflected. So, um, you know, perhaps all of these measures are contributory, but but they're not yet, um, we're not yet, yet addressing, addressing the rate limiting steps. So what's what's missing from the equation? If there, if there are a couple of big things to do that would deflect that curve, what would what would some, be some of the things on that list? Well, are you, do I yes, you do. yes, I'd say two things. There's a private investment and then there's the, the need for business to weigh in heavily to make sure we get policy in place. We got to get carbon price to be able to let the, you know, the flywheel start to move more quickly. On the private piece, back to share buybacks, I believe it's your colleague, Dave, who came up with this statistic. I still need the source that more money was spent on share buybacks in the year than 10 years of investment in the infrastructure bill that was passed. A portion of that is about climate, not all of it, but of course all of it is, reverberates if we do it right to a greener infrastructure and, and wins in that domain. But we need a lot more investment and we're not spending it on that, we're spending on pumping the stock price instead. And the stock price eventually, Sana, will hit a wall and we will, the system is is vulnerable, but yeah. we're still in this. On the, on, the, on, the, on the other side of it, what did the business sector do when it came down to the Build Back Better bill? And I know it's complicated and, we're, and deficits are a real problem and we are in an inflationary environment now, but there was potential to pull back and say there, there may need to be an, a tax increase to level up to make sure that every, all corporations are in fact paying some taxes to support this investment. That may be required. And regardless of what happens in the tax provisions, we simply have to weigh in and prioritize getting a, a price on carbon. And mm-hmm. that didn't happen. The business community said, we can't deal with the that piece of it because we're gonna put, have to put our weight into making sure the taxes don't go up. The average corporate tax paid is something like 7.8%. It's not, you know, there's a huge inequities in the system depending on the structure of companies and how easy it is for them to park their IP somewhere else in the planet. So we all know that story as well. So, so, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, I imagine you've got something to say about some of what Judy said. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, you know, back to some of the original points, I agree we're not green is not green yet. Uh, by the way, you know, the old adage that uh, the, the future is already here. It's just not distri- it's distributed evenly. There are places yeah. where it is green, right? So number totally. one. Number two, uh, and by the way, I, I, I agree, you know, uh, uh, carbon tax is one method, one policy method. I disagree it's the only method. In fact, I'd encourage everybody to take a look at the work that University of Massachusetts and MIT have done in the En-ROADS Climate Policy Simulator, which talks about all kinds of elements um, uh, from, uh, you know, alternative uh, uh, energy to innovation in carbon capture, which is too expensive right now, um, but also other other mechanisms, innovations, as well as other policies uh, that can help. And, and I do agree with Judy that business has a accountability to this end. I mean, that's why you know we just launched 10 companies in Baltimore uh, together with Techstars, the Stanley Techstars Accelerator, uh, focused on electrification working together with Upsurge in Baltimore, which is an Equitech accelerator, the world's first, we think, equitable technology, trying to bridge the divide, the divide between those who are less privileged. But most importantly, to be bold and break the mold, which is only 25% of outdoor today is electrified. Uh, if you take a look at at, at, uh, at you know blowing snow, which I'm sitting here in Boston Common and there's a lot of snow out there, um, or, or if you're cutting the lawn when it gets a little bit warmer, um, well, that's that's a 75 percent opportunity for business. And guess what? We just made yeah. a three billion dollar investment in a company, MTD, and we're going to electrify. it. And so um, I do think I agree with Judy. We're not green green yet, yeah. but we, we have a path to get there. Is it fully known? And no, but there are solutions and innovation is critical. Also with also people. People are. Critical. Let me ask um, about this sort of external dimension of resilience, because um I recently assembled a, a group of scientists to discuss the resilience of all the different systems. And their conclusion was clear, which is that they, they scored the different social systems of a resilient response. And the worst one was civil society, you know, divided, voice of science, yeah. ineffective, um, even disagreement on what the facts are. The social division got in the way of implementing a lot of otherwise good good policies. And, and, mm. and you, you, you pointed out um, the threat to democracy. So... Um, you know, that's probably an example of a problem where you, the best efforts of, of each company individually wouldn't necessarily constitute a solution. There needs to be some collective action. Now, traditionally, I guess the, the two main forms of collective action are um, the government regulating or um, structuring markets in a way that they, you know, they scale good things. Um, but it seems to me, um, you know, we have a a, a platforms and governance issue for collective action problems. Uh, J- Judy, would you agree? And what would you do about totally. that? Yes, I do. And I, you know, I write about this in my book that there, you know, there are forces that are actually moving the puck, you know, faster. And, the, you know, yes, you know, these rules are already in place and they're not evenly distributed. I love that quote. Um, but it's very clear that the, that the way forward has got to be more about, you know, kind of, co-creation today. It, it doesn't happen. We don't solve these problems one company at a time. And we're seeing we're seeing collaboration in different ways. The, and that is a, you know, another kind of one of these new rules is that businesses no longer set their own responsibilities. You know, those are set somewhere in the, you know, in the kind of ether and the ecosystem of companies that are influenced by NGOs that are perfectly happy to harness your brand and say, and to make a larger political point or a larger systemic point to bring you to the table and force change to where using you as a leverage point within your whole supply chain to, to get to a better place. That is something that's happening. And there are a lot of very exciting examples of that. The other thing I want to put on the table here that we haven't exactly talked about is employees are the ones that are becoming the real accountability mechanism for companies. Yeah. You know, investors are all over the map, frankly. Most of them, you know, it's like, yeah, I love this stuff, but I, I think it should only be win-win and I'm not really willing to compromise my own return for these great things that we're talking about. That is a reality of, of financial markets. And then we have this idea that consumers can lead. Consumers have like an attention span for boycotts. It's like a heartbeat. Consumers are not necessarily, they're going for price and convenience, enter Amazon. What we need is something more stable than that. And employees, ironically, have the same interests as the company. You know, they want the company to succeed. They want it to be innovative. They want it to be resilient. That's the key to their financial 
and their financial security is to make sure their company is excelling at these things. And yeah. they are a much better link between the company and what's going on and this kind of external world because they live in both and they are the interface. And if you talk to executives today, right. that's who's driving the change. That's a great insight, Judy. Uh, the uh, the mini societies that our companies uh, start starting there. Um, we just have uh, nine minutes left. So I, I wanted to put uh, one final question to each of you, which is um, supposing that you're a CEO and you're, your company is coming out of COVID and you're saying it's not enough that we coped and we're doing okay. You know, we, w- we want to fully leverage this, this opportunity to, to build back better, to build back more resiliently. Um, one or two concrete things that you can put on the agenda. What would that be? Um, uh, Mark? Well, uh, again, to echo my favorite uh, uh, African uh, proverb. Uh, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. So it's echoing something Judy said, which I I strongly resonate with, which is uh, do it with your suppliers, do it with your government, do it with your employees, do it with your customers, right? And and the journey will be much faster and much more resilient. Um, uh, We we, we recreated a plant, probably one of our most efficient plants using things like cold formation, uh, additive manufacturing, a whole bunch of the cool tech, but most importantly, done with more highly qualified but fewer employees and making it cost equivalent to an a- Asian uh, company, uh, to, to outsourcing, if you will. So we, we, want it, we want our plant, a brand new plant in Fort Worth, Texas, which we simulated uh, and we save money by leaning it before, by design digitally, you know, at very little carbon footprint. And then we uh, trained and, and hired, uh, hire, hired and trained a higher quality workforce such that, you know, 400 people run a 1,200 person plant. Um, customers love it. We brought craftsmen home to America. Um, it would doing good for the environment. It's we're using we have almost zero scrap. Uh, and so I think we can invent. Now, we didn't do it alone. We did it with our suppliers. We did it with our employees. We did it with the government. Um, that that to me, that going to, you know, forward together will build build a more resilient future. So I know you, you are the CEO or the, or the founder of a company. Um, yes. if, you, if, if you're looking for this, uh, you know, adding one thing to the agenda to make sure that we we leverage to be in a better place next time. What, what, what would you add to the agenda? Or what can CEOs do more generally? Yeah, I think that um, I really like what, what Mark is uh, saying and also what Judy is uh, saying, because I mean, as um, the, oh, <laughs> no, I didn't like something. Oh yeah, as the younger generations are much more picky about their employers. So Gen Z and millennials rather not work or earn very little and live a minimalist lifestyle than be with a company and do work they don't enjoy and that doesn't challenge them. So there's also the gray resignation going on right now. And a lot of millennials choose to be freelancers or start their own businesses or just not work and, and like go to countries where it's cheap to live. So I think that employ, employers have to just work so much harder to attract uh, companies and um, to, to attract employees. And for me, um, having a, that's, it sounds really corny, but like a purpose-led startup, people like come to me, they want to work, even if they're not going to earn that much. And they get um, shares because we're such a small company. So they really feel like part of something. And while I was building my business, I was all, always like sharing what I was doing and why I was doing it and like kind of building publicly. And then you really inspire people to uh, join your mission and you sort of talk about something like four day work week. You take very ser- seriously things like mental health, like the impact that your company has, like gender equality. Um, and then actually the right people feel attracted by that and they're they're willing to to work for you for half the salary less. Right. Than, it's interesting yeah. you come back to employees again as the uh, yeah. the signal that can be embraced to force the pace of adaptation. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Judy, Judy you, um, you've written a, a whole book about what should be on the, the CEO's agenda. What uh, In this context of building up better and more resiliently, what are the one or two items that could be, could, could could make a difference as uh, as, as CEOs consider their, their post uh, COVID uh, plans? They got a lot of things to think about these CEOs, and we're getting different CEOs coming to the table today who understand that they're the leader of a community, of an ecosystem, of a you know it's a it's a different kind of conversation. And I think the smart ones realize that, that requires different questions, and they probably from where I sit. We need to ask some of the questions that kind of sit behind the ESG, but don't don't really get enough attention. 
So if we replace the purpose of the corporation is to X and realize that resilience is partly, we need the system itself to be resilient. We need government. We need, we need the, our democracy to be resilient. I hope the CEO can start asking questions like, how much tax avoidance is too much? Like, what is the right rate for me at least to be contributing back? Um, what's my job story here? When I got out of college, you know, there were two responsibilities in business. I moved to Sacramento to work. We used to say responsibilities in business are to create jobs and pay your taxes. We can't take either of those for granted today. And a clear question in the tech sector and well beyond is to ask, why am I using contract workers? What is that about? Is that just about profit maximization? Is there something else at play here? But if it is mostly about maximizing profits, let's go back and take a fresh look at whether or not that is just fair and the best way to really build a platform that's resilient. And then finally, ask yourself, what am I being paid to do? And why have I accepted a pay package that's anchored 70, 80, 60, 90% in, in stock, is that really the best way to reward, assure that we're all rewarded? And are we creating stock performance plans for employees as well, who are the real contributors? And like, what would I design my pay to be today if I was really putting the long, long-term health of the enterprise at the center? So that's a, that's a great way of reframing it as uh, questions to ask, which will engender the curiosity and innovation to, to, to build back better and more more resiliently. So just in the remaining uh, two minutes, maybe um, taking that cue, cue from Judy, um, if one were to add one question to the agenda, one thing that you hope the top people in firms are thinking about, what would be the, what would be the killer new question to think about, Mark? Ooh, how do we move from resilience to, um, uh, to, to, to post, post-resilience where um, we build anti-fragile, that is right. organization flourishing, not res- restoring or conserving. Right. Precisely. Okay. So what's, what's, what's the big question you hope is on that's on all CEOs minds right now? I would like them to ask themselves, what's the biggest challenge in my industry? And then only do that. Okay. <laughs> like what has the biggest Good. lever for right. change? And Judy, what well, you, you propose the idea of question. So what's the killer question here? I think the killer question is, is my board, have I built a board culturally prepared to have the kinds of conversations that are not, that don't assume everything's a win-win and knows that we actually have real trade-offs and things that we're needing to, to deal with in real time? And what is that board, what are the protocols of our board and are we actually the kinds of conversations we really need to think forward? Well, th- thank you all for a great discussion. Um, we'd uh, for welcome us. feedback for, for, for anyone listening. Um, so we've been talking about building back better with resilience and imagination in U.S. business. And we've heard some really insightful and interesting perspectives, very diverse perspectives from uh, Judy Samuelson, the, uh, the founder and the director of the Business Society Program at the Aspen Institute, Mark Mabry, CTO of uh, Stanley Black & Decker, and Sana Alvadri, the founder of the Sage Fund. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks all.